Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 22, Chapters entitled The Marriage of Kardama Muni and Devahuti, Text Number 17. Yam Hayam Pristam Kavanat Angrit Sobam. Yam Hayam Priste Kavanat Agri Sobam Vikrida Tam Kanduka Vavalaksim Vikrida Tim Kanduka Vivalaksim Vishvavasur napatat svad vimanad Vishvavasur napatat svad vimanad Viloka samoham vimhuda chaitaha Viloka samoham vimhuda chaitaha Yam Haryam Priste Kavanad Angri Shobam Vikrida Tim Kanduka Viva Laksim Vishvafa Surna Patat Swarvi Manad Vilokya Samoham Vimura Chaitaha This the Any other ladies? Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Yam, who? Haryam Priste, on the roof of the palace. Kanat Angri Shobam, whose beauty was heightened by the tinkling ornaments on her feet. Vikri Datim, playing. Kanduka Vivala Aksim, 
with eyes bewildered, following her ball, Vishvavasu, Vishvavasu, Napatat, fell down, Swat, from his own, Vimanat, from the airplane, Vilokya, Singh, Samoha Vimuda Chaitaha, whose mind was stupefied. Translation purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. This is quite an unusually interesting purport and translations. And Kardama Muni is speaking here, and he's speaking to Vice Swayambhuva Manu about the glory of his daughter. After describing in the previous verse how beautiful she is, now he's describing what happened because of her beauty. Translation. I have heard that Vishvavasu, the great Gandharva, his mind stupefied with infaction, fell from his airplane after seeing your daughter playing with a ball on the roof of the palace. For she was indeed beautiful with her tinkling ankle bells and her eyes moving to and fro. Purport. It is understood not, that not only at the present moment, but in those days also there were skyscrapers. Herein we find the word Haryam Priste. Haryam means a very big palatial building. Swad Vimana means from his own airplane. It is suggested that private airplanes or helicopters were also current in those days. The Gandharva Vivavasu, while flying in the sky, could see Devahuti playing ball on the roof of the palace. Ball playing was also current, but aristocratic girls would not play in public places. Ball playing and other such pleasures were not meant for ordinary women and girls. Only princesses like Devahuti could indulge in such sports. It is described here that she was seen flying from the flying airplane. This indicates that the palace was very high. Otherwise, how could she see? I'm sorry. Otherwise, how could one see her from the airplane? The vision was so distinct that the Gandharva Vivavasu was bewildered by her beauty and by hearing the sound of her ankling bells, ankle bells and being captivated by the sound and beauty, he fell down. Gardama Muni mentioned the incident as he had heard it. End of purport. Om Agyan Timirandasya Ginajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadanti Swapadanti Kam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasari Gauda Bhakti Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So in these series of verses the pre- the two preceding ones and the following one. Kardama Muni is speaking to um, Swayambhuva Manu about the glory of his daughter Devahuti. And Devahuti is also there. He has brought his daughter with her. And now Swayambhuva Manu is, is asking Kardama Muni to accept his daughter's hand in marriage. Kardama Muni had already done that within his mind and heart, so there was no question. But here he's describing the qualities of Devahuti. And specifically here, her beauty is being described. So much so that he describes an incident where one Gandharva, whose name was Vivavasu, was playing, was flying in the sky, and upon seeing Devahuti playing ball on the roof of her palace, 
he fell out of his airplane. Sometimes they say one falls head over heels. <laughs> so here's an example. It's actually coming from the Bhagavatam. <laughs> How this Gandharva, now Gandharvas have and are surrounded by many beautiful women. They sing in the Apsaras dance. And so they're accustomed to being associated with, with very qualified and very beautiful ladies. But here we can see that the beauty of Devahuti was so extraordinary that he couldn't contain himself. And he fell down. <laughs> Prabhupada uses the word stupefied. <laughs> that means he lost all his intelligence and fell down. So here we see why why is does Kardama Muni bring up this incident? He wants to show just how much qualified his Devahuti is, and he knows that. He mentions her beauty. And it's interesting to know that Kardama's relationship with Devahuti is completely on the spiritual platform. Actually, Jiva Goswami brings that out in his Priti Sandarva. He says that this relationship between Karvadama Muni and Devahuti is not anything mundane. Not at all. But here, it seems like he's appearing just like an ordinary person who is infatuated by physical beauty. Actually, he's just glorifying Devahuti and bringing out her good qualities. Prabhupada writes, sometimes a, a saintly person will act in an ordinary way, but one should understand that it is not ordinary. Of course, it may, may, may be difficult to understand that from a particular point of view, but here we have the understanding of the scriptures to help us clarify that point, that, her, that his infatuation, which really was an infatuation, which was his desire to fulfill the desire of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He understood within his heart, and he had personal darshan with the Lord previously, that he was going to be an instrument for bringing into the world the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Kapiladev. So it appears in one sense that he's acting like an ordinary person, but actually he's not. And you see, as the verses go on, he, after describing the glories of Devahuti in so many ways, and she has so many good qualities. And by all standards of good qualities, she is she's the epitome of perfection. Her beauty, her abilities, her family, her, her chastity, everything about her is her is ideal. She's the epitome of what we say perfection of womanhood. But still, he's not infatuated by that. After describing all her good qualities, he simply smiles and then he goes into trance meditating on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So he's fixed on the Lord in all cases. So we may also talk about what is the attraction in this material world. Whom some striya mituni bhava meta tayorivat mirahanda yahur. What is that? What is that next one? Ato vihu visheta vitapta tisnaya janasa moham yamaham mameti. That the basic principle of material life is the attraction between the opposite sex. This is the foundation for material existence. And where does that attraction come from? And it's actually the natural attraction we have for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But when that attraction is diverted away from the, the source of all attraction, Lord Sri Krishna, then that attraction is diverted to things in this world. And the epitome of that attraction we might say, is the perversion of the adiras or attraction for the opposite sex, which is the epitome of foundation for material life. 
Um, one who can break that attraction, actually we heard from previous speakers in the Srimad Bhagavatam, even if one doesn't practice pure devotional service, even if one is completely free from that attraction and is perfectly celibate in their practice, they can attain Satya Loka, the planet of Lord Brahma. How powerful it is. But it is very difficult to break that attraction. In fact, it's even considered to be impossible. Even great stalwart, what we say Vaishnavas, who have climbed very high on a spiritual platform in their practice, have fell victim to these allurements. Uh, how to break that attraction? First of all, one has to see what is the nature of that attraction. Because if we don't see the nature of that attraction, then we think, or we may have become overly infatuated by the temporary nature of everything. This material world is by nature temporary. And what is beautiful at one time, because of the force of time, again, becomes something different. That is the nature of everything in this material world that is temporary. We see, you know, just in the life of ordinary people, one may be very beautiful and very attractive and have so many materially good qualities, but as time goes on, things change. I remember hearing one report about one very, what we say, by material standards, attractive lady. She was a movie star. And uh, she was French. Her name was, I don't know, maybe some of you don't know. This goes way back. Some of the older older boys and girls would know this one. Her name was Brigitte Bardot. Uh, yeah. And she was very, very... She didn't have too many material qualifications except for one, her beauty. And because of that, she made public appearances, magazines, and movies, and so many other things. Now, at the age of 50, she had a very traumatic experience in her life. She looked into the mirror and she saw the signs of old age came into her life. And because of that, she was overwhelmed by the fact that her beauty was fading. Because see, her life oh, just completely centered around her beauty. And everything she had in her life was based on that physical appearance. And seeing how that was changing, she could no longer accept it and she decided not to appear in public anymore. That's actually a historical fact. So we see even the most attractive by material standards, of course material standards are relative and what is attractive may be not be attractive to others. But as time goes on, even what is attractive becomes changed by the force of time. So this is the nature of everything material. But there is an eternal beauty. There is an eternal, what we say, attraction that never changes. And it always increases. And that is our attraction for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And only by developing that attraction... In the, through the process of purification of the heart and by engaging in devotional service, can one become, what we say, gradually freed from the attraction of the ephemeral beauty that, it, that makes up this material world. The beauty of this material world is also, in one sense, coming from the Supreme Personality of God. It is. It actually is Krishna's energy. Krishna explains in Bhagavatam, that just see the power of the attraction of the, the force of Maya in the form of uh, the opposite sex. Simply by that power, even great conquerors are destroyed. I think there was one great conqueror. His name was Alexander the Great. He was such a powerful conqueror. He can conquered so many kingdoms. But when it came time to come home to his harem of Laetis, he was conquered by that. <laughs> So, what is more powerful? You can see the power of this physical attraction is so strong that even persons who are known as powerful become sub subjected and just what we say, um, in affected by that and destroyed by that. But this attraction 
is temporary and it can only be destroyed or not destroyed but replaced by what we say attraction for the Supreme Personality of God. So actually in the 28th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Kapila Dev, in speaking to his mother Devahuti, he describes very, 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 what we say, what's the word, very carefully, the transcendental form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in all his different bodily features and explains the nature of that attraction in a very detailed way. Beginning from the lotus feet of the Lord and his shining toenails, his calves, his thighs where they're the source of all his strength, his navel which is the source of all existence where Lord Brahma comes, his beautiful chest which has the Srivats marking, the, the beautiful white curl on his chest, which is actually no, none other than Lakshmi Devi, who sits on the chest of the Lord. His powerful arms, his club. Of course, he's, he's mentioning Lord Vishnu in this particular description. And how he destroys the demons with this club. And Prabhupada goes into such details describing the nature of that club and how the club is actually muddied with the blood of the demons in giving such a descriptive uh, explanation of Vishnu and his club and his beautiful arms and then his neck and then of course his smiling face his pleasing glances all the way up to his beautiful beautiful eyebrows and in that particular verse describing his smiling glance and his beautiful eyebrows, it is explained that this meditation on this form of the Lord is so influential that it destroys the influence of the sex god. Cupid himself becomes dis defeated simply by meditation on the beautiful smile and the, what we say, the arched eyebrows of the Lord. How beautiful is Krishna? Of course, we are taking darshan of the Lord every day in various forms as Gorasundar, Gaur, Lord Chaitanya. He is called Gorasundar. So beautiful. His transcendental body is golden. Standing so powerfully, and smiling, and offering his, what we say, compassion to the fallen conditioned souls and of course Sri Sri Radha Madhava the beauty that we see of course everyone is seeing different is us only a small fraction of actually what is actually there as the mind and the heart become purified through the process of devotional service then actually one sees Krishna more and more as Krishna actually is. Krishna reveals himself. So that is how, and that is the process of actually elevation, is to become free from the attraction of this material world. Maya is very powerful. Maya is Krishna's energy. When Krishna was in Vrindavan, he was playing with the cowherd boys, and they were playing so many nice games and sports. And Kamsa, he wanted to arrange different ways for Krishna to be destroyed. So he kept sending so many demons to Vrindavan. And one demon he sent was Agasura. Big, big, powerful snake. It's described as detail in detail. How huge he was. Actually, he came not only to kill Krishna, but he came in a revengeful way because his brother Baka and his sister Putana were killed by Krishna. And so he was thinking, I, he was determined to get Krishna. And he lied down on the path, he opened his mouth and it's explained that from the lower lip to the topper lip of his mouth was eight miles high. You know, I used to think of that pastime I was when I fly in the airplanes traveling from place to place. And I was thinking, hmm, the pilot is saying we are up 35,000 feet. Now, that's about, what is it about? It's almost eight miles high, isn't it? It's about seven, eight miles high. I was thinking, wow, Agasur is really big. <laughs> Can't see anything down there. It's just the whole, just kind of just like a merge, you know. <laughs> so... 
So, you know, and these, these, the Shastras are not phantasmagoria, they're not exaggeration. This was the nature of the pod, the demons, how powerful they were in those days. Prabhupada said, nowadays the demons, they don't have much power. And they have suit and tie, and then they just make some legislation, that's all. <laughs> Throw a few bombs here and there and cause some disturbances. But nothing like the demons years ago when Krishna was there. So this demon, he decided to open his mouth. And then the cowherd boys, they were playing, and somehow they looked, and they saw this demon laying on the path. And they said to each other, oh, look, there's a cave we can go play in. And others said, no, actually, it's a demon. That's okay, Krishna will save us. So they, so they went inside, they went towards the demon's mouth, Jai Si Si Radha Madhava Ki And then they ran in, one after another. Somehow or other, it's explained in this pastime, Krishna's attention was in another way. So he didn't see at first the cowherd boys going into the mouth of Agasur. But then he turned and he saw. And it's explained in this commentary by the Acharyas that when Krishna saw the cowherd boys running into the mouth of Agasur, he became bewildered. Now it's not possible for the Supreme Personality to be bewildered by his own energies. He's the controller of his energies. His energies are always under his control. And even the demons, what is their power in relationship to Krishna? It's explained that even the most powerful demon, what was he, Harani Kashipu, was like a little wasp bifurcated by Lord Nisringadev. So what are the demons to Krishna? Nothing. But why, why does it say the Acharyas? Why do the Acharyas say he became bewildered? It's explained just to show how powerful Maya can be. That even if I can become bewildered, what to speak of you? Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma was chasing after his daughter for sex life. But what is Lord Brahma? He creates all the bodies within the universe. He formulates the energy in such a way that he formulates the 8,400,000 species of life. So how can Lord Brahma become bewildered? But he did, apparently. But Prabhupada said, actually, he's just showing by example what is the power of this illusory energy. Illusory means that it's there. It's not that it doesn't exist. It's just not what it appears to be. That is the nature of illusion. Illusion cannot... Illusion means you see it in a certain way, but that's not actually the way it is. So the nature of the illusory energy, it presents itself as an object of enjoyment. But actually, it cannot give enjoyment. So, with that understanding in mind, one has to, to actually fix their mind on what is the reality. And that is the beauty of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So as, we, as one becomes attracted to the beauty of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and all the qualities of the Lord, then gradually one loses attraction for this, for this ephemeral beauty of this material world, which is the cause of bondage, life after life after life. Prabhupada said as long as we have one pinch of material attachment, that pinch will force one to take birth again somewhere in this material, material cosmos. So a devotee wants to become free from all material attachments. A devotee is not so eager to go back home, back to God. A devotee wants to become a pure devotee and serve the Lord wherever the Lord wants. Of course, if we, if we want to go back to Godhead, that is glorious. But Prabhupada also explains there are a class of those who want to stay in this material world and act on behalf of the Lord to uplift the conditioned souls. But either way, it takes, what do you say, purific complete purification of the heart. So the process of devotional service is a constant meditation on 
extracting our, what we say, attachment, or removing our attachment for everything temporary, and fixing our attraction, attachment, on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. There is a class of philosophers say you have to become detached. But there's no question of becoming detached without becoming attached. Attachment is always there. But what is real attachment? Real attachment is on the Supreme Personality of Godhead in devotional service. So, here we see again in this particular sloka that Kardama Muni appears to be somewhat infatuated by the attraction of Devahuti, but he's not. He's not. How is it possible for him to leave that situation and just go on? He was, he knew what his duty was, and he performed that duty in an exemplary way. That example is given here, that one has to leave Grihasta life at a certain point. Of course, it is recommended after the children are grown up, then one should leave. The wife can also go to a holy place and take renunciation from all material. And then the husband can go on, take vanaprast, and ultimately take sannyas. We see in the material world, nobody does that. Everyone stays in the family life until the time of death, and then again they're forced to take birth again because of that attachment. So, therefore, the process of devotional service, even while we are engaged in, devo- in, in our household life, is a cultivation of detachment from that. Because the time will come when we will be relieved of that attachment, and then we have to be ready to move on and move on to what we say, full engagement in devotional service to the Lord. Okay. So, I'll stop here. Any questions? Yes, Prabhu. Nice and... Do we have a microphone anywhere? No? The roving mic is somewhere? Oh, yes, here it is. No, that's not. If you speak nice and loud... Hmm... Yeah. They're looking for the absolute truth. Yeah. That that the question is how is it why did Kardama Muni leave his household life when the absolute truth was born into his household? Good question, huh? We might have to ask Kardama on that one. <laughs> I guess I guess most of us would would think, well, I might as well stay. You know, God is here. <laughs> There's no other place to go. But that wasn't. It's explained actually. I actually read this answer to this, and I'm not so clear in my memory of the actual explanation. But I that. It was meant to be in such a way that he had planned to leave, and therefore he was already fully Krishna conscious. He had, he had he he had absorbed himself fully in the supreme personality of Godhead. He was seeing Krishna within his heart. He was a perfect yogi. He had reached that perfectional stage. So wherever he was, the supreme personality of Godhead was already with him. So whether he stayed or whether he left, he was with the Supreme Lord. But he saw it was better to leave and and become detached from the household situation. Remove himself physically from that situation. So there was no question of him not being with the Supreme Lord, whether he was there personally in his physical form or whether one is experiencing the presence of the Supreme Lord within one's heart. Because there's actually there's no difference. There's no difference. 
So that's the explanation that is given, that he was actually already associating with the Lord within his heart. So wherever he went, he was with Krishna. Is there any other questions? Yes, Suresh Prabhu. Mm-hmm. He has no reason to do it or not to do nothing it. Nothing to gain no. for himself, and nothing to uh, to avoid. He's, ah. simply, he's doing his duty. Mm. So even if there's no need to take to uh, to leave the Lord, he's setting an example. He's following his bon- He's following his ashram yes. by removing himself from that physical. Um, that's the actual point that is being made there. Yes, Prabhu Grahila. be a transgression of etiquette for the son to instruct the mother in the presence of the father. Yeah. So that's also facilitated. That's also a point to to allow for his mother to receive instructions from the son. And that would make it easier for her to assimilate those instructions more direct. Yes, Kritamala? The microphone is coming. <laughs> Yesterday in Srimad Bhagavatam class, uh-huh. we heard a very clear understanding that it's not really important uh, which ashram or varna, it's imp- that bhakti is independent from yeah. anything and anybody. Yeah. So your question is, why leave the Grihasta ashram? Because that's the process. <laughs> because in Grihastha Ashram, there are other activities that are required in order to maintain that ashram, which are parallel to what we say the process of pure devotional service. So to be free from all those extra encumbrances and to be able to focus, and it's also risky. It's risky to stay there because we never know. To be with another person for so many years, 25, 30 years, a type of attachment can develop. Naturally will develop. Wherever there is affection, there is attachment. Even when affection is, is changed or attachment is changed by situation, that affection still remains in some seed form. It's always there. You even see that. When people sometimes get divorced, there's always still a little bit of attachment there because of previous situations together. That's the, that's the psychological, physical nature of the human being. So why risk the opportunity of having that Whatever is left of attachments remain. So therefore, better to remove yourself from that situation and focus completely on what we say, full devotional service. It's risky and it's not recommended by the Acharyas. (laughs) Anyone else? Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.